Peace. What's good? How y'all doing today is June 5th, 2022. I pray that this message reaches you in the best of health, spirit, and mind. I am still working on my background sound effects and my voice. So hopefully I'm coming through clear right now. Um, I have some frequency music in the background. I'm kind of trying to set a tone so that these videos are beneficial for you guys in multiple ways, not just, you know, listening to my voice and to the information and content that I'm sharing, but also having the energetic resonance in the background of the frequencies and the sounds. So hopefully this is coming across clear. I did a couple of sound tests again, um, but I did a couple of sound tests on the, um, dissatisfaction brings change video and although I could hear myself clearly I didn't like the way the final um, actually I was okay with the final result but I did notice when I used the fork tunes and the music bowls that the um, the variation in the pitch you know the high pitch low pitch it affects the sound so hopefully this one comes across more clear one of my um, subscribers on YouTube told me I need to get a mixer and I'm starting to think he's probably right I think I actually have a mixer. It's just in my garage, um, you know, stored up with some other stuff. So, but that's another subject for another time. Peace and love. How y'all doing today? Um, today's subject is going to be self-confidence and self-trust. And before I get into that subject, I just want to remind everyone, I now have a private membership channel available where you can watch this full one hour video in its entirety, as well as all of my content, uh, exclusive content, which I have been putting a lot out of lately. And most of that is gonna be available on my website. I am also now offering uh, on-demand videos. Some of my content will be available on demand if you prefer not to subscribe, but still wanna listen to my videos in their entirety. Um, and lastly, um, not lastly, I also work with, I always forget to say this, maybe, I don't know. I work with clients exclusively. So if you're interested in working with me on a, in a, on a one-on-one basis, um, you can email me at info at zazali.com. I have workshops and courses available on my website as well. All of that's available at my website, zazali.com. My next event will be July 23rd of 2022 here in Los Angeles. I'm going to be doing a private intimate dinner, sunset rooftop um, for a small number of people. And then directly following, I will be having a town hall sort of meeting of the minds um, July 23rd. So stay tuned to all of my pages. I will be posting flyers and the uh, information on how to purchase tickets soon. All right. So self-confidence and self-trust. Um, I want to start out with a reading from You Are the Placebo by Dr. Joe Dispenza, who is one of my favorite spiritual scientists. I have always appreciated his work. And um, this particular book, You Are the Placebo, is one of my favorite because it really underscores the untapped power of the mind and the extensive levels of you know power that we can amass if we tap into the power of the mind so on page 160 uh the section is called the anatomy of beliefs and perceptions quote when you string a succession of thoughts and feelings together so that they ultimately become habituated or automatic they form an attitude and since how you think and feel creates a state of being, attitudes are really just shortened states of being. They can fluctuate from moment to moment as you alter how you think and feel. Any particular attitude can last for minutes, hours, days, or even a week or two. For example, if you have a good series, excuse me, if you have a series of good thoughts that are aligned with the series of good feelings, you might say, I have a good attitude today. And if you have a sequence of negative thoughts that's connected to a sequence of negative feelings, then you might say, I have a bad attitude today. If you revisit the same attitude enough times, then it becomes automatic. If you repeat or maintain certain attitudes long enough and you string those attitudes together, that's how you create a belief. 
A belief is an ex- a belief is just an extended state of being. Essentially, beliefs are thoughts and feelings or attitudes that keep you thinking and feeling over and over again until you hardwire them in your brain and emotionally condition and condition them into your body. You could say that you have become addicted to them, which is why it's so hard to change them and why it doesn't feel good on a gut level when they're challenged because experiences are neurologically etched into your brain, causing you to think and chemically embodied as as emotions, causing you to feel your beliefs are based on past memories. Most people, I would say, I would would add that. Um, Let me just make sure of something. Okay, great. So when you revisit the same thoughts over and over by thinking about and analyzing what you remember from your past, these thoughts will fire and wire into an automatic unconscious program. And if you cultivate the same feelings based on past experiences and you feel the same as you did when you, when the event originally occurred, you'll condition your body to subconsciously be the mind of that emotion and your body will unconsciously be living in the past. And if the redundancy of how you think and feel over time conditions your body to become the mind and it becomes programmed subconsciously, then beliefs are subconscious and subconscious and also unconscious states of being derived from the past. Beliefs are more permanent than attitudes because they can last for months or even years. And because they last longer, they, they become more programmed within you. I wanted to start off with this particular passage from You Are the Placebo from Dr. Joe Dispenza uh, because it's definitely relevant to our subject today, self-confidence and self-trust. You know, we were talking yesterday, well, I was talking to one of the sisters yesterday in my Sovereignty of Self course, and we were talking about being triggered or triggering, right? And what I was saying to them is that, you know, the irony of being triggered or triggering is that once that, you know, that realization or that emotion or that feeling or that, you know, staggered energy sort of comes up, let's say you're triggered by a commercial or you're triggered by seeing another, you know, another family with their family and not having a family of your own, or you're triggered by something you see on social media or just something in the world. And you go into this space within your mind, within your emotional body and within your physical self, that's based on something that's not even happening. So it's not even real. Now that doesn't devalue or underemphasize the fact that you may have had a tra- traumatic experience, right? You see a, a, a loving mother and son or mother and daughter relationship and it triggers you because you never had a mother, right? And a, you never had a mother or you never had a, a proper relationship with your mother, right? That doesn't mean that the original rub or the original pain or trauma isn't real. It means that you are having an emotional or mental or physical reaction to a memory and something that is not currently happening in your reality and in your environment. So you could say, well, I didn't have a mother, so I never felt love, but then have a spouse at home who loves you unconditionally, right? So that statement, I never had a a mother, so I never felt love, right? Is that really true? Well, you never felt a mother's love. But in this moment, when you're triggered, you're feeling, you're feeling loveless. You're feeling that original rejection or that original abandonment from your mother, even when you're surrounded by love. Right? So going back to Dr. Joe Dispenza's You Are the Placebo, and this is, you know, I've been talking about this for a long time, as well as a lot of people. Um, in terms of this power of the placebo versus the nocebo, right? The placebo is basically 
Um, this is a Zaza Ali definition, not Dr. Joe Dispenza, so pardon me. Um, but the, the, placent, the, the placenta, the placebo is basically a, an overwhelming body of evidence that proves and verifies that a person can be tricked, quote unquote, into healing themselves. So you have, you know, sugar pills, you take a sugar pill, you think that you're taking the cure for some sickness or some disease, you take the pill, you believe it works, your body is healed. Or, you know, they've had a number of, you know, fake surgeries, right, where they make the person think that they're actually getting surgery, and they never do the surgery, they might, you know, do an incision and then sew it back up or, you know, whatever, there's a lot of different surgical and medical procedures that have happened for a long time now, this isn't new. And people think that they have actually been healed, therefore their body heals. So it's the emotional countenance and the mental ownership and claiming of health and well-being that the body is actually reacting to. So this is important because shifting away from physical health and into mental and emotional and spiritual health, right? Talking about self-confidence and self-trust, you can program your mind and your emotional body and your physical body for well-being. And that concept should actually be easier to understand than the idea of the placebo, meaning I've accepted that this sugar pill or this water pill that the doctor has given me is going to heal my body from this chronic pain or chronic illness that I've been dealing with for a long time. He said it works. So I believe him. And so your belief is what actually validates the thought, validates the information, validates the prayer, <laughs> validates the vision, validates the desire, validates the long and midterm and short-term goals. Your belief. <laughs> I just have always found that fascinating. And so in um, uh, Dr. Greg Braden's book, The Divine Matrix, I was reading this last night, um, he said something to the effect of, um, for our prayers to be answered, we must transcend, I think that's the word he used, we must transcend the doubt that often accompanies the positive nature of our desire. So in essence, are you really answering your own prayers? <laughs> that takes nothing away from, you know, God, this concept of God, this concept of the Lord of all Lords or Supreme Being takes nothing away from it. Because you're a microcosm of the macrocosm. Your spiritual being B E and then I N G. Your being or your soul is a microcosm of the macrocosm. So when you send out a prayer of frustration or a prayer of self doubt, the micro you is sending that prayer out to the macro you, the all in all source energy collective consciousness, the divine mind, Allah, the all in all, the Netaru, the Orishas, the microcosm, which is you, your individual personal self, sends a prayer through and out to the microcosm which is, excuse me, the macrocosm, which is you, the microcosm, plus all divine infinite intelligence. So whatever the frequency behind the prayer is or was, is the frequency that reaches the macrocosm consciousness. And the macrocosm consciousness magnifies and increases and sends back that prayer to you.
So what is the soul, right? What is spirituality? Because that's my metaphysics and understanding the world from a spiritual perspective and connecting myself to the mind of God, to the mind, the divine mind, the source energy, what created all that is. That's what I love to do. Even when I'm talking about, you know, quote unquote, conspiracy type things, I'm still looking for God. <laughs> Even if I have to do a fiery, passionate video where I am, you know, espousing some madness or addressing something that I may meet, make me or other people feel uncomfortable, I'm still looking for God. That's why I trust myself. That's why I have confidence in myself here in 2022. And trust me, it has been a struggle. In his book, Spirituality Before Religions, Spirituality is Unseen Science, Science is Seen Spirituality. This is by Professor Kaba Hiawatha Khamenei, excuse me. I hope I'm saying his last name right. On page 44, he's quoting, or page 50, 45, He's quoting Dr. Sobonfu Some in the book, The Spirit of Intimacy, which says, spiritual inspiration's purpose is to bind us in such a way that we maintain our connection, not only with ourselves, but also with nature. Spirit helps us fulfill our own life's purpose and maintain our sanity. Spirit is the life force in everything. Spirit helps us accomplish our life's purpose and maintain our connection to the cosmic world. Why is this important? Well, for obvious reasons. But in terms of self-confidence and self-trust or lack of self-confidence and lack of self-trust, we, we have produced so many generations of people and human beings that don't have self-confidence and self-trust because they're not spiritually connected to anything there's no connection to nature there's no proper understanding or seeking of a life's purpose to maintain connection to the spirit world see the life pur purpose is a clear indication and understanding the life's purpose is a clear indication of a connection to source energy or what he called the cosmic spirit world. How, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people and they tell me they don't believe in themselves or they feel lost. So you as this wonder, wonderful, magnificent, vibrant, powerful, limitless being Who has lost connection to source? Who has stopped doing what's in your own personal best interest? What does that even mean, doing what's in my own best interest? If you don't know the answer to the question, then that is the answer to the question. Like I always say, sometimes the question is more important than the answer. He goes on to say, still quoting Dr. Somme, Life is the search for spirit. It is an intimate journey. The body dies when the life-giving animating spirit, excuse me, force of spirit leaves the body. The spirit does not die when the body dies. The spirit moves on to the next world. When the spirit is captured by the body, the soul is born. And the soul is the personal energy that each living thing or being possesses. Let's think about this for a second. Life is the search for spirit. It is an intimate journey. Are you in search of your spirit? <laughs> Are you in search of your life's purpose? Are you connected to your deepest, most passionate, most inspirational 
desires. If you don't feel in, uh, inspired about your life, I understand why you wouldn't believe in yourself. If you haven't created a world that cultivates and evolves and celebrates your inner being and your higher self, it should make sense that you don't have any confidence, self-confidence. It should make sense that you don't trust yourself. By the way, when you say I don't trust anybody, you can't possibly trust yourself because you haven't cultivated the ability to attract human beings that are trustworthy and that trust you. You can't possibly expect for anyone to trust you fully and unconditionally if you don't trust yourself. So I say never trust anyone that doesn't trust anyone. And that's a big, you know, uh, that's a, a staple, a, euphem a, a euphemism, if that's what I, you know, what I want to say. Um, in our culture, I don't trust nobody. Then who can trust you? I would never trust somebody that tells me they don't trust anyone. <laughs> it's just, you know what I mean? Now you can, there, trust has layers. You say, I trust you to be who you are. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. And when I'm talking about the higher self and the lower self, I'm going to read a passage from Abraham Hicks talking about the inner being in just a moment. But when I, when I talk about the higher self and the lower self, these are direct reflections of what we consider heaven and hell. Higher self is always seeking heaven. Higher self is always radiating love. Higher self is always trusting you that you'll do what's, what's in your own interest. Knowing that the path is, that you're on the path and you're exactly where you need to be. Higher self is intuition, gut feeling. Your inner compass, your internal knowing. I could say lower self, I could equate the lower self to hell, but I don't think that would be like a mathematically correct equation because the lower self serves a great purpose. I guess I could also say hell serves a great purpose then, right? I don't believe in a hell underneath our feet. I don't believe you're going to, you know, physically die burning in, in, a, in a never ending inferno. I used to do a, a presentation um, about this subject and I would, you know, put the globe up on a map and, you know, talk about the inner crust and the depth of the earth and how could it be possible for a physical place underneath our feet that is burning physical souls, non-physical souls at an extreme temperature? How could that, how could that reality exist anywhere in, in the physical realm? And then if your soul is burning, then we're not talking about an actual physical burn. We're talking about torment of the spirit. So the lower self, not necessarily equating that to hell, but the lower self is where all the problems come in <laughs> and it serves its purpose, obviously. You know, how can you know love if you've never really experienced pain? You don't really know what love is until you've had your heart broken. In a relationship by somebody you care about who, you know, mistreats you. Children break their parents' hearts every day. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of... It's kind of part of the, um, the process of parenting. And when I say break your heart, you know, that can be, that can mean a lot of different things. Staying in abusive relationships, for example. Devaluing yourself, for example. Not believing in yourself. I don't know what will break my heart more. 
Life is the search for spirit. It is an intimate journey. It's basically saying we come into third dimensional reality into this physical time space dimension with the preconceived notion, not a preconceived notion, actually. We have to come here and forget who we are. That's the birthing process, right? You come here, you forget who you are. You're introduced into this family. You're introduced into this physical world. You don't know anything except your heart compass and your internal knowing, which is cultivated over time. Maybe you grew up in a, in a healthy, sane family. Maybe you didn't. If you didn't, that means that that's a master teacher and an important aspect of your growth and development to become the person that you have the potential to become. If you did, that means that's a very important part of your growth and development to become the person that you're meant to become. Neither is better or worse. The strongest and most courageous world changers, thought shifters, thought leaders, inventors, they usually come from stories and backgrounds of difficulty. Not always, but usually. So you could look at a person and, well, how, do, how did she get so smart? How did he get so intelligent? Why does she have what I don't have? They learn how to properly process and appreciate their master teachers. Maybe an alcoholic father, maybe an abusive mother, maybe a physical deformity, maybe low self-esteem, maybe a traumatic experience with molestation or rape. Maybe a wealthy family who doesn't know how to love. Those are all master teachers. Some of us get snagged on the master teacher instead of standing on it and growing tall and growing strong. And this is where the lack of self-confidence and self-trust comes in. What I was saying yesterday in my sovereignty of self course, the meeting that we had, <clears throat> Whether you had it or not, whether you had a wonderful family, whether you were incubated in an environment of love and trust and righteous people and loving human beings, whether you had it or not, you deserved it. And that divine spiritual birthright will be restored in one way or another if you get in alignment with that intention. So that was an intention for me once I had my son and I saw how pivotal or, or how, how immeasurable the relationship is between a mother and her child. And then the weight of the world hit me because I realized I never had that. True, pure, unconditional love from my family, from the people that were charged with my proper and safe handling and care. I didn't have that. So one of my deepest desires and driving desires was to build a life for my son and for myself that included and embellished all of that. And not only that, God has given me the wisdom and the clarity through my life experience and through my soul's trajectory because a lot of what I do cannot be accounted for in my upbringing. 
I didn't have, you know, family and people around me that, you know, hey, let's study metaphysics. Let's go. And, you know, I, I didn't have those things cultivated me in my environment. A lot of it was already in me. And then, of course, sympathy and compassion, all of those wonderful attributes that were cultivated in with me in me based on my life experience. A driving desire for love that has made me fall in love with God. <laughs> you know, people like to make mockery or make fun of that notion. I, you know, I'm in love with God. Not a, my concept of God is so different than most people. So I, you know, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. But if I say I love God, that means I love life. I love nature. I love the science of the mind. I love the way that the mind and the mouth can articulate information and wisdom and transmute that to another human being to raise them up. I know the power of words. I've experienced it at the hands of, of someone else. And I've had many people experience it from listening to my content and my work. I have a deep understanding because of my desire rooted within me to understand love, to feel love, to give love, to express love, to emanate love. So what is your inner being? <laughs> it's verification that God loves you, in my opinion. The microcosm and the macrocosm the inner being being the 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 you know the little god if that's the i don't even like using that term because what is a little god stop it god with a lowercase g stop it so your inner being is the little is the big you right from a spiritual sense, it's the big you. It's the microcosm of the macrocosm. Let me read this quote from the law of attraction, uh, Abraham, Abraham, Bri Abraham Briggs. <laughs> I was reading Esther and Jerry Hicks and it, you know, tongue twisted. But on page 34, it says you are much more than you see here in your, in your physical body. For while you are indeed a wondrous physical creature, you exist simultaneously in another dimension. There is a part of you, a non-physical part of you, we call it your inner being, that exists right now while you are here in the physical body. Your emotions are your physical indication of your relationship with your inner being. I wanna read that again, because this is critical. Your emotions are your physical indication of your relationship with your inner being. When people say, this is me, Zaza, <laughs> not quoting now. When people say, stop being so emotional or you're being too emotional, like we understand what that means. You walling out, you're you know, consumed with anger. Okay, that, that's warranted but you can never stop being emotional because you're an emotional being and your heart center is the most powerful aspect of your electromagnetic being. So your signal is either stronger or weaker based on your emotional countenance. So when you're vibrating in love, when you feel happy and invigorated and inspired, your signal is strong. And you, when you feel angry and hatred for whatever you feel anger and hatred for, it doesn't matter. Your signal is weak. Do you think having a weak signal affects your self-confidence? 
She goes on to say, in other words, as you are focused upon a subject and have your specific perspective and opinion about it, your inner being is also focused upon it and has this perspective and opinion about it. The emotions that you feel are your indication of the match or mismatch, mismatch, <laughs> I say <a> mismatch <laughs> as a word in the hood. Um, the emotions that you feel are your indication of the match or mismatch of those opinions. For example, something may have happened and your current opinion of yourself is that you should have done better, better or that you are not smart or that you are unworthy. Since the current opinion of your inner being is that you are doing fine and that you are smart and eternally worthy, there is a definite mismatch in these opinions and you would feel this mismatch in the form of a negative emotion. On the other hand, when you feel proud of yourself or love yourself or someone else, your current opinion is a much closer match to what your inner being is feeling in the moment. And in that case, you would feel the positive emotions of pride, love, or appreciation. Your inner being or source energy always offers a perspective that is to your greatest advantage. And when your perspective matches that, then positive attraction is occurring. In other words, the better you feel, the better your point of attraction, and the better things are turning out for you. The comparative vibrations of your perspective and that of your inner being are responsible for this magnificent guidance that is always available to you. Since the law of attraction is always responding to and acting on whatever vibration you are offering, it is extremely helpful to understand that your emotions are letting you know whether you are in the process of creating something you want or something you do not want. One thing that I do when I work with women in particular, and they have issues with self-esteem, self-confidence, you know, fear and self-doubt, when I hear them talk about themselves in a negative way, and this is also in, um, I think, Keys to Womanhood and Change Your Mind workbooks. I was supposed to show a commercial at the beginning of this video, but I was all excited to get into it. So I totally forgot about my commercial. <laughs> but I have written two uh, books and four workbooks, six books, that'll next video. That's mainly for YouTube anyway, but um, what was I saying? The inner being. <clears throat> so that fear and that self insecurity, when you are having those sort of reactions, even the triggering aspect, right? all of the lower nature vibrational feelings and energy. When you are experiencing those things, that is a strong reminder that you're looking at yourself in a way that is completely opposite or different than the way that source energy sees you, the way that God sees you, the way that your inner being, your soul, the micro of the macro, you fighting with yourself and downing yourself and talking negatively to yourself and your inner being is not gonna play along. So your inner being is trying to guide you, but you're not listening. That's why you don't trust yourself. That's why you don't have self-confidence. So if you ask yourself, why don't I believe in myself? And this is a figurative you know, question, we're just talking. Usually it's because of the projection of the world. Usually it's because of the projection of family members who don't really, are not really in touch with and in alignment with their inner being either. So they reject you or they don't take the initiative to validate you. All human beings are seeking validation. I don't care how confident you are, how self-assured you are. It's a part of the learning trajectory while we're here to validate one another. And through that process of validating one another, we learn how to val validate ourselves. Going back to the master teachers, some of us learn how to validate ourselves because there wasn't anyone 
to show us the way. Some of us learn how to validate ourselves because we had strong support systems to show us how to validate ourselves. But it doesn't matter, matter whether you had it or not, you deserved it. That's the empathy and the compassion speaking through me that came from my master teachers, which was not having it because I didn't have it. I've cultivated a great amass of it. <laughs> I take it very seriously, my responsibility to help people feel love. That's why I can't look at my life through victim-based consciousness. It's been a wonderful journey. I know who I am. Not perfect, but I'm definitely standing strong and confident and resolute in Zaza Ali of in Zaza Ali in 2022. Thank you very much, Master Teachers. If you don't know who you are, how can you have self-confidence? If you don't know what you want in life, how can you have self-confidence? If you continue to allow people to take advantage of you, energy vampires, how can you trust yourself? If you're committed to a relationship in a marriage or in a partnership or in a business relationship that makes you feel insecure, how can you possibly trust yourself when you're committing to something that is not in your best interest? If you're constantly questioning your integrity because of choices and decisions and behavior patterns, how can you possibly trust yourself? If you're not moving in your own personal best interest with your own wellness and well being as your primary focus, how can you trust yourself? We have rela built relationships in society, you know, the family dynamic, the friendship, societal dynamic, and then the broader collective consciousness that are tethered to this in dysfunction. I dropped my pen and I scribble, <laughs> I put a mark on my wall. Um, you know how I talk sometimes in my hand swing. Well, yeah, my right hand just swung. And yeah, I just put a, a blue line on my wall. <laughs> If you haven't learned how to listen to your heart, learn how to decipher what it's telling you going back to the inner being. Oh, I feel, I don't feel right about this. This guy feels wrong. I think he's lying to me, but the sex is good. So I know he's lying to me, but we're well taken care of. So I'll put that on the back burner. Maybe he'll grow and expand. I know she's using me for my money or for what I can do for her, but at least it's a form of love. A one is better than a none. No, not really. Not if it's gonna make you doubt yourself and not love yourself and abandon yourself because you have to abandon yourself to be in a relationship that's not cultivating and evolving your inner being. So your emotional self cultivates and demands trust. But if you're in an emotional volatile environment or an emotionally volatile relationship or at a job that's nonstop chaos, but you're dedicated because you need the money, yeah, the bills will get paid, but you won't have any trust in your emotional self. How can you trust yourself when your physical body is telling you that you're putting harmful toxins and harmful chemicals by way of McDonald's or <laughs> Fanta soda? You say, I love myself, but then you treat your body like trash. Why should you trust you? You say, your mind is, my mind is playing tricks on me. I can't stop thinking negatively. I am my own worst enemy. 
You talk negatively and disrespectful to yourself all the time and then wonder why people disrespect you or why people don't respect you. You don't respect yourself. Why should you trust yourself? Eating artificial foods <laughs> and then expecting to have longevity in life. We don't even research the things we put in our bodies. We just let these people tell us anything and we go along for the ride. Why would you trust yourself under those conditions? There's overwhelming resources and information available to us all that for, verifies for a fact that the earth has everything that our bodies need to be healthy and well, to heal. We don't even seek the information out because we're separated from source. We forgot who we are. And the whole purpose of being here is to come back into that remembrance. Some of us aren't even on that trajectory. That's not even a conscious decision, a conscious awareness, a reality, a desire, a goal, an intention. So how could you possibly trust yourself when you're, when you're not moving with the intention of servicing your, your inner self and your higher being? your inner being and your higher self. How can you trust yourself spiritually when you don't even address yourself spiritually? You know, I say when people, if you can't spend 20 minutes in meditation, quiet, still, at peace with yourself, without thinking about social media or thinking about the world or thinking about the to-do list or thinking about the children or thinking about mistakes, your mind doesn't even belong to you. It belongs to the world. Why would you trust yourself? If, you don't, if, you're, if you're scared to sit with your own mind. Human, excuse me, human feeling and emotion that affect the stuff our reality is made of. It is our inner language that changes the atoms, electrons, and photons of the outer world. Feeling is the key. Feeling is what the universe recognizes. That's a partial quote from Greg Brayton. I wrote it down, but then I remixed it. So there you have it. If you keep disappointing yourself, you'll never trust yourself. If you don't know how to listen to your intuition and your gut instincts and your inner being, and you keep denying your higher self, which is where all of that comes from, it's going to be difficult to develop self-confidence. The repetitive nature of the majority of people on this planet who are operating from their lower self and out of touch with their inner being, most people think the same thoughts every single day. Your brain is a magnanimous machine. Haven't seen anything greater than it yet. Comparing, you know, the physical body is one thing, but I'm just saying in terms of what this world has created. I haven't seen anything come close, but guess what? Just like in The Alchemist, when it talks about um, Santiago, uh, at her, I think he was having a conversation with the king or somebody along his path. And they were talking about the heart, right? One of my favorite quotes from The Alchemist, um, tell your heart that the fear of suffering is greater than the suffering itself. Tell your heart that the fear of suffering is greater than the suffering itself. I think that's it, don't quote me though. But basically all the fear, all the things that you're worried about, what could go wrong, worst case scenario, what if they don't like me? All of that energy, all of that thought process is worse than the potential outcome. And it's not even real yet. <laughs> a 
So the way that your brain works is that you every time you think a thought, you're firing off a, a, a little spark of light in your head, right? And depending on how the thought makes you feel is what determines the strength of the signal, talking about the electromagnetic field again, your energetic resonance, and that heart energy. So if the feeling, if the thought makes you feel horrible, then you're gonna contract and expand within yourself. And then you're gonna think about all the people that ever hurt you or all the people that lied to you or all the times you failed right in that moment. It's a whole mind game that's not even really happening, only within you. And if you think a thought and the thought feels and you have a new idea or an invigorating concept or a remembrance of a beautiful experience, and then your heart is like, yes, I feel this, we feel good, we're flying, we're, you know, everything is wonderful and beautiful in this moment, then your signal is strong. But if you're thinking the same thing every day, wake up, I hate this job, or wake up, this is a, you know, mediocre job, this is a mediocre experience, my parents, left me for dead, nobody cares about me, I don't have any support system. Living in a mediocre or repetitive, I should say, condition. You can't build self-confidence because in order for your brain to operate at its highest capacity, every day you need to be thinking new thoughts. And then those little beams that fire off every time you think a thought, you know, little light neurons, so to speak, little, little, little fragments of light. There's video, you can see this, where they've, you know, scanned the brain and depending on the, the, the variation in the strength or the weakness of the thought, it'll fire off a bright light or a basic light, or you see what I'm saying? But in order for your brain to operate at its highest and best capacity, you have to be challenging yourself. And if you're not challenging yourself, why would you have self-confidence? We're here to grow. We're here to expand. We're here to create. That, that creative element, I, I just cannot talk about that enough. We are here to create life, physical life, spiritual life, mental life, emotional well-being. We're here to create physical things, buildings, cars, electronics, knickknacks, souvenirs, books. So if you're not creating, it's hard to trust yourself. So you say, I don't believe in myself. I know you're not creating. Because <laughs> if you were creating, you would be establishing belief in self. If you say, I don't trust myself, then I know you have a pattern of neglecting yourself. Or you had that first thought. You know how people say, you know, my first, I, I went against my first mind. That whole indecisive element. Make the decision and then stick to it. Win, win or loss. I left it all on the field. Okay, we live in. What's next? So maybe on a physical level, it was a loss or a mistake or an error. But mentally and spiritually and emotionally, you've expanded to, to new heights because you've done something you've never done before. You're creating. It's all good. You in the mix. <laughs> a lot of people are not in the mix of life. They're not shaking and moving and moving and shaking and creating new things and having new experiences and going to new places and meeting new people and having new conversations and new ideas, newness. That's everything in the universe. You see constant change, constant evolving.
So when we say I went against my first mind, I knew I should have listened to my first mind. What is your first mind? What does that even mean? <laughs> That's your inner being. Constantly talking to you, constantly trying to help you, constantly trying to guide you, constantly trying to show you the right way, constantly trying to assist you in whatever it is your struggle is, and you're not listening. That's why you don't trust yourself. I'm going to leave you guys with this last passage from The Secret of Successful Living. This is from The Super Beings. I've read this. I have two of these books, right? I have my my old one that I has highlighting and it's missed up for the front. It's a mess, right? Because it has a lot of miles on it. Then I have the new one that I don't even want to touch because I don't want it to look like this. So I always use the old one, but it's all good. On page 68, um, this is a basic outline that was developed for expansion of consciousness by John Randolph and the people that he was working through, working with through the, the creation of this book, The Super Beings, quote unquote. I didn't mean to do that. <clears throat> Number one, what do you desire in life? You must focus on, you must focus your thoughts on what you really want. Number two, you must make a definite decision to accept the fulfillment of your desires. Three, your desires cannot be fulfilled in the outer world of experience and form unless you have the consciousness or mental equivalent for them. That's critical. I'm going to circle this. I'm going to do a video about this. The first number four, the first step in building the mental equivalent is to recognize that the divine idea corresponding to your desire already exists in your super consciousness. This is the intellectual awareness. Number five, but an intellectual awareness alone does not have sufficient power to shape the outer picture. Your feeling nature must be brought into play. When the two are combined, a powerful reaction takes place in the subjective phase of mind, setting up a vibration that corresponds to your spiritual equivalent of fulfillment in your super consciousness. So when I talk about mind and heart synchronicity, that's a perfect summation. Number six, I'm not going to read all of these. I'm going to stop at six because it kind of solidifies the point. This fusion of mind and heart along the lines of a particular desire or fulfillment, if protected from thoughts to the contrary, will develop into a conviction. The conviction of mental equivalent becomes the pattern through which the creative energy of mind flows or radiates. As this energy, light, power, substance passes through the pattern, it takes on all the attributes of the pattern and goes forth into the outer world to manifest corresponding circumstances, experiences, and form. You want to develop self-confidence and self-trust? Work on getting your mind and your heart in synchronicity. How you think and how you feel. Listen to your intuition. Listen to your gut instincts. Take a chance on yourself. You're never going to learn how to fly if you don't. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're never going to learn how to fly unless you take a chance on yourself. Maybe you don't want to fly. <laughs> well, then that's, you know what I mean? Because does your inner being want to fly? <laughs> you better believe it. To the highest heights. And then come back to the ground and find a new journey to explore. Info at zazali.com. If you have certain subjects you want me to talk about in the group, I'm going to be posting the um, Ask Me Anything segment today, Sunday. So you'll have that to listen to as well. <laughs> Hopefully you don't, you're not getting, I haven't uh, uh, bombarded you guys with Zaza Ali to where you tired of me yet. I'm just kidding. Uh, info at zazaali.com. Zazaali.com is my website for those of you who may purchase this uh, video on demand. I hope you guys have a wonderful day today. I hope you do something really, really good for yourself, um, even if that means just doing nothing. Peace and love.